It's a world expo with millions of visitors. It's a world stage. Why don't we try and do something that really demonstrates that you can do a completely self-sustaining building in one of the world's most demanding climates? So when we were approached to take part in the design competition uh, for the sustainability pavilion, from the outset, the brief was that it was to be a permanent institute, which I thought was quite exciting. So when we set out to uh, host the World Expo, it was under this umbrella theme of connecting minds, creating the future, to talk about themes that matter to humanity. So that includes sustainability, mo mobility, and opportunity. And the idea was to get the whole world gathered together in one place to connect and to talk about ways and to share innovations about how we could meet these challenges that we're all facing together. There was quite a long process where they evaluated the designs and then we heard that we'd been picked. And I think the client, you know, from the beginning, bought into the idea of doing something that was truly quite adventurous and truly completely self-sustaining. The Grimshaw proposal was one that caught our eye because, in essence, the proposal was embodying the theme of sustainability, and it was about creating a machine that was sustainable in its structure, in its design, in the way that it delivered uh, energy and the way it also recycled water. A lot of the exhibition space was black box space, so they don't want natural light. And so that allowed us to actually sink the building down two levels, actually nearly three levels. And so that immediately means you're in a cooler environment, it's 10 degrees cooler, but also you are heavily insulated um, from the, you know, the hot air in, in the environment above. And then um, the, the remaining space, um, we actually took the landscape over the building. And so that landscape roof uh, heavily insulates the rest of the building. So actually all of the building in a way is kind of immersed in the landscape. And those concepts were surprising. They were challenging. They were almost, unexpected in many ways, the integrity of the materiality combined with the theatrical experience that you find within the walls, within those galleries, is something that instantly you saw was nothing like anything else in the world. You knew that we had an idea which could push boundaries and then the challenge was of course realising that in the form that we see. I think uh, one of the key critical things was building a sustainability framework that everything was guided by and was central to the whole project, be it the architecture or you know, any aspect of the engineering. And we kind of developed it from there. So it, it kind of almost became an organic design based on you know, clear uh, goals that we'd set out uh, from the outset, really. In a way, we were kind of inspired by the gaff tree, which are these beautiful trees you find in the desert that sit on their own with these very deep tap roots and just give shade in the middle of the desert. And so that was very much an influence for the canopy. You have this kind of cantilevered canopy, almost like a tree, that harvests the sun, so it has all the PVs on it, but also it actually brings in breezes and pulls in the air to the courtyard. So I would say it was from the concept stage, and of course um, we came to the design phase, uh, which was extremely challenging because what was being proposed was not a regular structure. Uh, it was a structure that was designed to also um, challenge the way that you construct buildings in general. And then when we did the calculations and thought about how much energy the building would use uh, and the other requirements to do with water and so on, we realised even covering all of that canopy with highly efficient um, photovoltaic cells wasn't going to be enough um, you know, in its own right. We worked a lot with parametric design to really develop that, make it as efficient as possible and incorporate all of the great things it does you know, in terms of generating power, providing shade, uh, reducing energy consumption in the building, even treating sewage and water through passive means on the roof as well as generating the power of course through the PV.
And really the landscape, in a way, is also a big part of the story. But we thought we could actually use the landscape as well as part of the energy equation, if you like. We came up with this idea of uh, what we called energy trees, e-trees. And they were kind of inspired by the uh, dragon trees uh, from Yemen. They also have this very interesting kind of structure. So we thought, well, if we track the sun, A, they can become kinetic sculptures, although thinking about it when we really got into, of course, you, you never actually notice them moving because they're, they're, they're moving throughout the day very, very slowly as they track the sun from east to west. But that actually increases the amount of energy they deliver by another 25%. So the combination of the two then gave us the kind of four uh, gigawatt hours that we needed for the building. And it became quite quickly a concept to, to try and maximise the power that we could uh, generate on site, particularly around the canopy as the kind of the focal element. But then the trees played an important part in tying into that and really generating the rest of the energy from that kind of that energy balance that we needed. And I guess in terms of, you know, those being kind of quite iconic elements you know they needed to be high they needed to be quite big um, so they were bold statements anyway so it's quite a large structure 130 meters and it's cantilevering 70 meters at the far furthest end so a lot of time was spent working uh, with our engineers at Bira Happold working and looking at different iterations um, to half the amount of steel in the roof structure to make it as light as possible you know so when you when you look up Actually, you see a lot of space, a lot of air, and, and you uh, see the photovoltaics and the photovoltaic systems. I think for us it was important to have that kind of lightness and also to have the use of the glass photovoltaic means you get this beautiful dappled filtered light coming through the roof structure into the courtyard below. The most important resource in this part of the world is water. And we looked at all sorts of technologies of pulling water out of the air, of uh, you know, different systems, and then we realized within the time frame we had, we had to be fairly practical. And so we can actually generate water through reverse osmosis, because there's a kind of brackish water, at quite a high water table. So that um, gets purified and brought into the system. Um, and then you'll see when you go around the landscape, obviously the byproduct is a very briny water, and we didn't want to put that back into the system, so we have dehydration, you know, hydration beds where we allow the water to evaporate and then we um, harvest the salts out of it. But most importantly, uh, it's a closed loop system, so all of the water is recycled. And the key thing was balancing, you know, where do we take the water from and how are we going to use that water? and then really matching those two up and, and creating systems as efficiently and as passively as possible so we can uh, close those gaps. From the beginning, because it was going to be a permanent building and it was going to be a kind of part of this new innovation district, the garden space we thought was very important. It's almost like a park. So we wanted to think of it as a kind of museum in this park setting. But again, demonstrating new thinking. You know, we were all open to other ideas outside of our disciplines and I think that's what makes this project really successful is the different ideas from the different disciplines all coming together and to create something quite unique. So rather than using traditional temperate planting, you see it often like grass, deciduous trees and so on, need a lot of water. Um, we wanted to show how you could create a xeriscape. Uh, and have really exciting planting but using a minimum of irrigation. And so we worked with our kind of long-term partners, the Eden Project, on the themes for the landscape and the stories we could tell. And then a very innovative landscape firm called Desert Inc. The pavilion really, we see it as like a, a vehicle for new ideas and one of those new ideas was to collect seed from the mountains and the deserts out there in the Emirates and to bring them into cultivation. And we found some fantastic plants that nobody was really using before this project and it gave us a chance to try them. And so again, it's demonstrating how you can do things in a new way using the minimum of water. And the only irrigation we do use is again treated um, wastewater. So when we first set out to do this uh, pavilion and this experience, we were intent in making sure that we 
you know, people come out of it inspired uh, to be change maker themselves. So you come into, uh, you know, quite a generous triple height space, which is the main entrance space. And as you walk into it, you get an amazing view out to the canopy and to the courtyard above. And then that's why we put in those very generous stairs. And then you come to the first level where we have the auditorium and so it'll be able to host symposiums and events. But for the visiting public, you can then make your way down to the next level and you come to the exhibition space. The client was very keen that people should have a quality experience and, and we wanted to have it with no queuing. To do that, so we actually reverse the circulation. So we use all of the landscape as part of the experience. You can wander around and we actually split the exhibition into two. So they're very similar, but they're two different themes. One's called Under the Ocean, one Under the Forest. And you make your way down through uh, before you then join together again and make your way back into the courtyard. One of the greatest things about this experience when I personally go and see people experience it is the conversations that we trigger uh, through the different types of journeys that you can take in this pavilion. The exhibit itself, I think, is very kind of visceral. It's an immersive theater rather than it being technologically driven because you want people to interact with it, to feel part of it. They're almost like actors within this set play. And that way, I think they're both uh, entertained more, but also absorbed more. And if you entertain people and capture their imagination, they'll pick up more and learn more. Once they've kind of come out of that experience, to then make their way up and then uh, go back into the garden space, I think, you know, is a, is a nice balance. And then we thought it would be rather nice to have a some space you find almost like a special, you know, inner sanctum where you could look down and you could see a pool of water and then look up all the way through the building, through the canopy and see the sky and have this connection between the two. So we added that kinetic sculpture now in it, like a kernel right in the centre of the building. As we developed the exhibition spaces, we also wanted to create a connection to the outside. We put those sort of little biome spaces, if you like, and so you have that view out from the lower exhibition space back out to the landscape. Walking through it, you sort of understand how people need to sort of move towards sustainable ways of life, and it's not just sort of a bigger concept, it goes down to like each individual. And the way it's been constructed around made it really interactive, so I think there is a difference between talking at someone and making it quite interactive, and I think the interactive element has is, is really come through with this one. It's really nicely where you see how it was at the starting and then it comes to what humans are doing and then it comes to how you can change it which is pretty, it's a cool concept I feel you get to, you can absorb more that way which was a good experience for me so far. Terra is a permanent institute so we saw it as this sort of important building set within this overall context of a new city but actually it's almost like a piazza. It's a space where you then break out and have kind of breathing space. It's a green lung, uh, if you want. My hope is that this will push design in that direction, which will give people a lot more freedom, will make buildings a lot more efficient, a lot more sustainable, uh, a lot less embodied carbon can be used in them because we're not constrained uh, by, you know, kind of artificial barriers, if you like. Uh, so I'd say for, definitely for those reasons, uh, it's, it's something that will, should have a legacy for, for, the, for the region. Whatever it is that we were setting out to build was to carry on post the expo. It permanent structure, it children's and science museum, carrying the spirit of what it delivered during the expo period. <laughs>